Hi everybody, David Harper here. I'm en route to Helmsley in North Yorkshire where I'm going to put on my theatre show tonight. It's a stand-up history show based on my book A Romp with the Georgians. So this is looking at stories from the period 1714 to 1830. It's comedy history. Stories our history teachers just seem to forget to tell us. Real dastardly strange funny things you've never heard before. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to record the whole show. Warts and all mistakes cock-ups, everything. And I don't mind doing it because it shows that it's unscripted, it's live and it's real. And it's based on the questions that come in from the audience. And another reason why I don't mind sharing it is because no two shows are ever the same. So you can watch this on YouTube, then come to one of my shows or book me for an event. And every show I guarantee will be different to the last. So here we go. Warts and all, nothing hidden, nothing edited. Here is a romp with the Georgians. Let me know what you think. Also, just to let you know that this is a family-friendly show. There is no swearing. It was once described, actually, by a journalist as horrible histories for adults. Well, adults, yes, but I would say anybody 12 years up. That <laughs> this is just a moment or two before the show, getting to know my audience. Well, I'm hoping you've all got some alcohol. I can see most of you have, and you're brave at the front of you. Seriously, I mean, have you ever been to a theatre show before? Yeah. <laughs> Sitting at the front, my goodness me. Well, hello, welcome to A Romp with the Georgians. <laughs> Date period 1714 to 1830. We're going to talk about your British Georgian ancestors and by. God, they were an eccentric bunch. I mean, I can see, I can see where they got it from. I mean, come on, look around you. <laughs> so this is all about that period in time. It's a celebration of the eccentricities of the British people. We'll talk about crazy pets, strange jobs, muddy laundering, dodgy politicians, tax evasion, all sorts of stuff. It sounds like today's modern world, doesn't it? There are no politicians, you know, there. And is there anybody here who works for the BBC, first of all? Thank God for that, because if there's anyone here at the BBC, I would be cancelled this time tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to tell you. And you can fire away with questions as well. Whatever you want to know about your packs of these. This book, here we have a romp with, I'm selling it tonight, £10 a book. <laughs> it's, it's normally £12, so you're in profit already. And if I sign it, you can put it on eBay for a fiver. <laughs> I wrote this book two years ago. And I set up a 40 theatre UK tour. It was all ready to go. And then guess what came along? Covid! Devastating it. So what I've done is, I, yes, I wrote the book and I reread it. Sometimes my wife says, what are you laughing at? And I'm laughing at my own book. I mean, it's a bit sad. But I've, I've created lots of notes because it seems such a long time ago. I've got to remind myself. But oh, we've got a late, oh, hello, welcome, madam, thanks for coming, that's great, fill the numbers up. I'm calculating how much money I'm learning tonight, and it's not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but let's start with fashion. The Georgians loved fashion. You wouldn't believe it. They loved fashion even more than we do. And looking around, I can see there are not very many people tonight who enjoy fashion. <laughs> But we've got to start somewhere, haven't we? <laughs> so fashion in the Georgian period is pretty exactly opposite to today. So we like to have a nice glowing suntan. This is the time of year now. We go on holiday, we come back nice and tanned. We look lean and mean and keen and healthy and rich with a nice suntan. The Georgians, this would fill them with horror if they had any money. And just like today, the Georgians like to show they had wealth. So today you'll have a Range Rover in black with cream leather parked on your drive to show you're rich, right? <laughs> Georgians, 
You have to be as pale as the driven snow. Because if you had a sun-kissed and sun tan, you would look like a ruffian. Because you'd work outdoors. You didn't want to look like you were common digging holes or anything like that. And what's the side effect when you're outdoors working? You get a live body. You didn't want a live body like you, sir. <laughs> you did not want that. A Love Island physique like yours would not be fashionable. You had to be porky. Porky and white. And as white as possible. And how, do you, I'm sure you know this. I'm going to start you off with very easy stories here. How did the Georgians make themselves as pale as possible? Makeup, madam. Yes, make up. But they didn't call it make up like we call it today. Do you know what they called it? They called it paint. Because that's what it was. It was effectively a white wash, the kind of stuff you put in the backyard at Granny's house on the wall. A white wash. And what was it made of? Do we know? Yes, you know some of these stories. Oh, yes, isn't it? This is the intelligence section, I'm just going to say. <laughs> they, they always seem to congregate together. <coughs> Arsenic and mercury. Two very dangerous ingredients. But they didn't know they would, it was an, a dangerous concoction. They didn't know that. What they did know, that it was very expensive to make this white paint. So you had to have lots of money to wear the white paint. So you looked drop dead gorgeous. But the more white paint you put on your face, the more likely it was that you were going to drop dead. <laughs> because the mercury and the arsenic, of course, caused eruptions in the face. Now, madam, if I mean, I'm not thinking of you intentionally <laughs> when we're talking about eruptions in the face. Okay? <laughs> but when you have eruptions in the face, ladies, right, what do you do? You disguise it with makeup, don't you? Right? And so the George has put this white stuff on, you get all these eruptions, all this arsenic and mercury doing all these nasty things to your skin. What you do, you put more on. Makes you even worse. It even affected the teeth. The teeth were rotting, and the teeth were going black because they loved eating sugar if you had money. And the Georgians used to stain their teeth. They used to whiten their teeth like we do. Do you know what they used to do that? Sulfuric acid! <laughs> Try it, you've probably got some in the carriage, it was. <laughs> Again, the teeth, the black teeth would become white for a period of time before they completely dropped out of your mouth. <laughs> it's not a great look. Right, so they were paying a price for fashion. And some of the side effects when you were putting the white makeup on was hair loss. No funny gags there, right? All right, just because you're still... Is that a wig, in actual fact? Because I'll be talking about wigs in a minute. I might be using it. Hair loss! <laughs> now, a wig, it was fashionable to wear wigs. I'll get into them. So if you were losing your hair, men and women, it didn't really matter because everybody wore a wig if you had money. And if you didn't have money, you would look like you still lose your hair because you weren't wearing the makeup. So wigs, yeah, they were very, very popular and very expensive. Do you know what a, what a wig maker was called, by the way? A knob thatcher. That's a wig maker. A knob thatcher. You've heard of a knob before, did you say? Well, what are you looking at your husband for? That's it. That's horrendous. I mean, seriously. A knob is a head. A head. That's it. So a knob thatcher is a wig maker. Now, where was I? Makeup. Right. <coughs> Hair falling out fits with a wig. However, your eyebrows would fall out, ladies, as well. So you had to cure that, and for men. So what the Georgians would do, they'd have these mangy eyebrows clinging on for dear life, dropping out. You couldn't go out like that. You'd either paint them in, like people do today, but the Georgians would use burnt cork. So they'd burn the cork and then literally mark above their eyebrows, or they would use soot from an oil lamp. And that works until you go out to a party and you're sweating and all your black stuff is running down your face. I've seen some ladies are going, that looks so nice. I can see that. Maybe it's a Helmsley thing, I don't know. <laughs> 200 years behind the times. But the best thing to do to disguise your bald eyebrows was to wear false eyebrows. And the Georgians were masters at this. Can 
you will discover when you read this book for a tenner. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing changes. There's every, anything that goes on, politically, upheaval, wars, it's all there. It's all happened before. History just repeats itself. So don't we wear false. I mean, ladies, you go out with false eyelashes, don't you? What are you shaking your heads for? I can see most of you are wearing false eyelashes. It's not unusual. So what do you think they made their false eyebrows out of? Uh, did you say animal fur? Uh, you're saying it in a very like cagey sort of way. You're a bit afraid to say it. Rodents. Ro ro is it like <laughs> rodents? Give her a round of applause. She's absolutely right. <laughs> rodents. The Georgians were very environmentally friendly. <laughs> now, <laughs> some things do change. So if you were to kill a rodent, skin it, which I'll get on to, and wear it on your head, people would create cardboard placards and walk through the streets of London to have you cancelled, wouldn't they, for doing that? The Georgians didn't mind this. Most houses had rodents problems, mice. So what the Georgians would do, they would catch a nice mouse, the paler coloured ones were quite prized, they would kill them, skin them, dry them out, and then they would cut the skin into a lovely shape of an eyebrow and stick the eyebrows onto their heads using animal fat glue. Now luckily for you, I have had a bit of a mouse problem recently. <laughs> and so I'm going to show you the look you get when you skin a mouse. Now, luckily for me, I've got modern glue. I'm not having to use animal fat. Oh. <laughs> this is the look <laughs> that you get when you wear mouse fur eyebrows. The problem, however, occurred when you did go out on the town and you'd be worried for a bit of slippage because the animal glue was not prone to work all night long. And so, ladies, you take a little pot of animal fat with... Do you see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's not a good look, is it? A mono eyebrow doesn't work very well. So the ladies would take a little pot, out not of animal fat out with them and their friends would keep an eye on their eyebrows so if you had a bit of an eyebrow slippage they'd tell you so you could readjust yourself because if no one told you you'd had a few drinks and it slipped and it landed there that's not great that's not a good luck either and so that's what they'd have to do and there's a lovely account i write about in the book of a lady in 1770 went out for dinner with her husband in london put on her false eyebrow mouse furs, went out for dinner, spent two hours in a restaurant looking at her husband over a candle lit dinner, very romantic, got in the carriage, went home, walked into the house and was horrified to see on the floor of the tiled floor of the hall, one rogue mouse eyebrow. Looked in the mirror, she was only wearing one big fat mouse eyebrow. Her husband had been having dinner with her all night long and hadn't even noticed. <laughs> Ladies, what does that say about men? I mean, seriously, men don't change, do they? <laughs> Two hours. Now, so that's that. Another thing they used to do with their mouse fur, they would wear beauty spots. Now, you know about beauty spots. You know that the Georgians used to wear those. And they'd wear them for the same sort of reasons, by them, eruptions, hide and eruptions. But have you got what you want? Do you want to borrow them? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were wearing one. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but also, it was amazing because these beauty spots also sent messages. There was a language of beauty spots. You know, today we have text messaging, emails, that kind of thing. The Georgians had similar things. They had beauty spots. And if you went to a political meeting or even a party where you knew people were political, you think that, I mean, today we're all very politicised, left, right, whatever, and I'm right, you're wrong. It's all like that. It's all fighting and bickering all about politics. It was just the same then. And if you went to a political meeting, you would wear, if you were a Labour supporter, so a Whig, you would wear a beauty spot underneath your right eye. 
if you were a Tory supporter, the current Conservatives, you would wear a beauty spot under your left eye. So just sending a, not even subliminal, just a message to say who you supported. Nothing changed. But where it gets interesting with beauty spots is when people were going out on the dating scene. Do we have any singletons tonight? <laughs> Anybody who wants to be single? <laughs> oh, I say. Oh, we've got one there. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you some hot talk. Georgian dating <laughs> tips. This is what you would do, ladies. You're going out to a party. If you were engaged and you didn't want men to come and talk to you, you would wear a love heart underneath your right eye. If you were married, again, you didn't want men to talk to you, you would wear it under your left eye. But where it gets interesting is if a lady was single, she would go out, and if she was feeling flirty, she would wear the beauty spot to one side of her right eye, sending the message to you, sir. I'm in a bit of a flirty mood. Come and talk to me if you feel like it. Thank you very much. It's the trousers. Yeah. I wore these in Scotland recently whilst filming. I tell you what, they did not go down very well. I thought I was going to blend in with the natives. I thought that's why. You go to Scotland dressed like a Scot. That's I thought they all dressed like this. They were a bit offended, so I'm better off wearing them in hand. Anyway. So that's that. But wait, we have more. Animal fat. What's this one? This one is feeling passionate. I know it's getting better, isn't it? Yeah, okay, then there's another area. Now, by the way, you've got to know the language of the spots, because if you don't understand the language, you get the wrong messages, right? And then we've got another one here. What's this one? This one is feeling playful. I know! And chaps, if you went out to a dance somewhere and you met a lady wearing all of these spots in one go, you were in for one hell of a night. <laughs> so the Georgians, hot dating. You know the Georgians used to sell their wives? Did you know that? It, now you're interested, it's gone very quiet, has been over here. It was not unusual for a Georgian gentleman <coughs> to sell his wife in auctions. Do you know why and how this was the case? No, no but you're interested, aren't you? Yeah. Do you know, there are no accounts whatsoever of any Georgian ladies being sold in public auction ever complaining about being sold. Because it was a way around getting a divorce. Oh. Do we have any solicitors in the audience? Oh, we do have one. Good evening, madam. You're very brave to admit to that, aren't you? <laughs> now, getting a divorce today is, is an expensive business, isn't it? Very. Oh, come on, honestly. <laughs> what a typical solicitor answer. <laughs> it's very expensive then. It's very expensive then. And I love solicitors. One of my friends is a great solicitor, so I, I have no problem with solicitors. But do you know what sailors used to call sharks? Sea lawyers. That's what sh the sailors called, that's what the nickname of a shark was, a sea lawyer. Fascinating. So lawyers have always had a bit of a reputation for being expensive. They do a great job, but very expensive. So what they would do in the Georgian period, it was actually, strictly speaking, illegal, but perfectly acceptable. If, are you two married? Yes. Okay, do you know what day, market day is in Hounsley? Uh, you better look this up, right? Find out when it is. <laughs> So what you do on market day, if you want to get a divorce and you're happy to do it, but you don't want to go through the expense of it, then what you would do, you would agree on market day to go along with your wife, bang a bell, get everyone's attention, and say, I'm going to offer my wife for sale. I know, I mean, what, where would you start the bidding? I mean, it's really not, isn't it? Right? There are accounts. Oh, are you, what's that, sir? <laughs> you could sell him, you could. I mean, looking at him, I don't think you're going to get much for him, but still. <laughs> You'd be better off selling her. I'll, I'll be bidding on this one. <laughs> so, uh, where was I? Right, I'm selling you wife. Yeah, I'm on 70% commission. Yeah. <laughs> 
You would make a public spectacle of the fact that you were going to sell it once. Even if you didn't get any bits, I'm sure you would. You'd get plenty of bits. I mean, never mind the car bunkles, nobody else. You'd get, uh, you'd get plenty of bits. And there are loads of accounts of the wife's lovers, well, I mean singular, I mean it could be plural, lover <laughs> bidding. And so the lover would bid on the wife, and then the three of them would go to the tavern to celebrate the arrangement, and this is how it worked. Because at any time in the future, you could tell your... What's that? <laughs> it's a jolly good idea. It's a jolly good idea. <laughs> oh, why didn't we know about this until now? I've, I've dug up this recent... Solicitors have kept this quiet for a very long time. <laughs> So what they would do is that yeah, they would make a public announcement. And in those days, a, any partner could sue the other later on in life, if they came into money, I'm sure it's the same today, or if they had sexual relations with another person, they could sue that person. However, if it went to court and it was proven that you had several years ago with witnesses sold your wife in public auction, the judge would just kick it out. So it was a very cheap way of getting a divorce. Weren't the Georgians so inventive? They were, sounds good, doesn't it? You're in such trouble tonight. <laughs> but the Georgians invented everything. We wouldn't be here, genuinely, under electric lighting, if it wasn't for the Georgians. Who drove here? So who's got a car? I'll stop showing you, honestly. <laughs> we wouldn't have a car if it wasn't for the British Georgians. They don't get nearly enough credit. They kick-started, invented, built the Industrial Revolution, and when it comes to revolutions, that revolution was a very good one. Improved the lives and lifespan of hundreds of millions of people around the world. And there are so many examples in Georgian history, later into the empire, the big empire days, of ordinary people. This is what I found fascinating when I wrote this book. Ordinary people. When we, when we were at school and we were taught history, it was all about highfalutin people, not the ordinary people. The vast majority of cases, it's the ordinary people that built the Industrial Revolution and the empire. Because the British in those days were very good at spotting talent. If you had talent, it didn't matter who you were, where you came from, whether you were educated or not. It didn't matter. This idea of social classes and barriers, you could rise from the bottom to the top if you had talent. It was a meritocracy. And one of the best examples, and one of my heroes of all time, is George Stevenson. You, you've heard of George Stevenson. What do you know about George Stevenson? I'm not that sorry, really. <laughs> He's called the father of the railways. He's called the father of the railways, madam. He is. When you picture George Stevenson in your mind, he's a big guy, big, very rotund guy, uh, terribly well dressed. There's paintings of him with steam trains in the background, big country houses. What do you think? What do you think of his background? He lived it till he was 18. Oh, you've just ruined my whole <laughs> night. <laughs> you ruined it. <laughs> you know, I told my father not to come to my church anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. I've never met anybody who knew that. George Stevenson couldn't read or write until he was 18 years old. His father was a minor. He couldn't read or write. Loads of children. George Stevenson went down the pit at 12 years old, but the pit owners didn't take them long to discover that George Stevenson could fix stuff. He was very good at fixing things, but more than that, he was very good at fixing them and reinventing things. So the steam engines were pulling out the water and pumping air into the mines. George Stevenson had this idea of making these steam engines move down tracks to pull things and he started designing them. So the owners of the mills just kept promoting him until George Stevenson decided at the age of 18 to enrol at night school and to learn basic reading and writing. By the time he was 30, he was one of the world's best known genius engineers. And he came from nowhere, totally inspirational. 
And again, if he hadn't been the father of the railway, he wouldn't have transportation like he did today. Remarkable. So you can thank your British ancestors for that. Their DNA is in you, which actually, I mean, they were eccentric. So it does, I mean, when you look in the mirror like that, and you'll, you'll realise, you'll go, I know I'm eccentric, but I blame my British ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> do we have any questions at all? Go on, be brave. What do you want to know about? George oh, and I pets. What's that? George and pets. 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 Do we have any pets? Yes. What have we got? Cats. 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 Dogs. Dogs. Birds. We're not talking about his girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Cats and dogs. Do we have anything more exotic than that? Sheep. Sheep. Do you have them as pets? Or do you just breed them and sell them? What, you have them as pets as well? I mean, I mean we've got till Tuesday, do you want to try and make your mind? I mean, are they pets or do you eat them? <laughs> cats and dogs. The Georgians love their cats and dogs as much as we do. The British are very much known around the world for being pet lovers. Georgians were just the same. They adored their pets. And in actual fact, they adored them more than we do. Because sadly, we've all, if you've got pets, you've all lost pets. You lose your pets, you bury them, you cremate them. It's terrible, devastating. The Georgians rarely did that. They stuffed them. <laughs> <laughs> they stuffed them. Because they liked them sitting by the fire, stuffed. They liked them in the carriage. Because the pets, like they love going in cars today, the dogs, used to love going in carriages. Women would make their dogs into muffs to keep their hands warm. They had no heating in the carriage. What do you expect them to do? The dog's dead. It's environmentally friendly. Honestly, the dog can still look out. <laughs> he hasn't got much personality anymore, but he's looking out the window. Honestly, you can't be squeamish about these things. Obviously, they didn't keep mice as pets. I mean, that's, you know, that's a given. But they did like their exotic pets. And in 1790, the height of George III, because George III is my favourite King George, there's four Georges. George III was a bit mental, but he was probably the kindest George. And out of interest, all four Georges, do you know what the common denominator between the four of them were, apart from being related? Sons, uh, grandfathers, brothers, do you know? They all hated one another. They absolutely hated one another. They were the celebrity dysfunctional family of their day. But anyway, George III, during this time, say, say 1790, you could walk through the streets of London and they say that walk down the Strand at 12 o'clock at night in 1790 and you will hear the roar of a lion. There were lions living in London. Rhinoceros, giraffes. There was an elephant later on in the early part of the 19th century living in the stable block at Buckingham Palace. It's remarkable. They loved their pets. But one very popular pet, try and guess what this pet is that people would have. And if you search online for Georgian family portraits with pets, you might just see one. It's an indigenous creature. They were as popular as dogs. What do you think it was? A what? A wolf? An indigenous, I mean, how many wolves live in Helsley? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they used to be indigenous, probably in the medieval period. Any other? A carrot. A carrot, did you say? <laughs> oh, sorry, I knew you'd been drinking, but yeah. <laughs> a carrot! I mean, I know that you can, you can self identify as anything these days. I mean, seriously, if I, I might just be a carrot, I'd probably get more TV work if I said to the BBC, I'm now a carrot. <laughs> what else did you say? A squirrel, yes! Squirrels. Squirrels were popular pets. Apparently, you can train them like dogs. But of course, there would be the red squirrels in those days, because the greys were introduced for about the 1870s, many years later. Yeah, there you have it. The Georgians. So come on then, do we have any questions? Test me. What about medicine? Do we have any doctors? Sanitation. Sanitation. Well, when you talk about sanitation, are we talking about latrines? Yes. Is that what we're talking about? Well, basically, <laughs> latrines, toilets, didn't exist. Okay. They were invented properly in the 19th century in the Victorian period with all the big sewer systems. 
during the Georgian period, very different indeed. So a place like this, a theatre, or a pub on the market square, would have facilities. There would be outhouses, netties, or dry netties, and the toilet facilities, if you're squeamish, close your ears, would just be straw and rooms. And toilet paper wasn't invented, by the way. They would use leaves, or, I oh, know, you still do, you say, do you? <laughs> well, it is Yorkshire, we like to save money. Yeah. <laughs> Vegetable peelings, oh. and of course, newspapers. I mean, I have a brother who loves saving money, he still uses newspapers, but anyway, that's another story. Newspapers, in actual fact, it's a Georgian that invented the term broadsheet. You know that, you know when we read a newspaper, it's called a broadsheet. Do you, does anybody know why it's called a broadsheet? That's just great. Thank God you only knew one thing. <laughs> Absolutely delighted. They can't even decide whether they've got sheep as pets or they kill them. This is the, the dream audience. <laughs> Broad sheets. Now you see, I'm going to just touch on taxation here. There's you know, tax hikes at the moment, got to pay for everything that goes on. We're all moaning about it and complaining. You think that's new? Not at all. The British government have been taxing us and hiking taxes for all sorts of things, mainly to fight the French, admittedly, which is probably not a bad thing, but anyway, they did, right? And uh, there we go, that's right. <laughs> You couldn't say that in Lincoln, North London. You really couldn't. <laughs> oh my God, honestly. But Joe wins. Anyway, there's nobody here from London, is there? No. <laughs> that. Anyway, broadsheets. What happened is the government said to raise more money to fight the French, they said to the newspaper owners, and bear in mind there were lots of newspapers in those days pamphlets, uh, flyers, gossip, columns. There was a huge amount of printing going on. Not many people could read. But whoever could, if you could read, and no one else could read, which is likely, you would probably, you would read to them. You'd tell stories. And so it was, it was very popular. And the government decided to raise more money. They were going to tax the newspaper producers an extra percentage in the pound on each page. So the newspapers would say, with this bit. So the newspaper owner says, Fine, taxes as much as you like. We're just going to double the size of our <laughs> newspaper pages and we're now going to call them broad sheets. And that's where we get broad sheets from. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Great, aren't they? Yeah. And so we're back onto latrines. I know this is an interesting topic for you, particularly, Mother. I don't know why. But anyway. <laughs> because the Georgians didn't have these things, I'm going to tell you two stories here. One, how do you think they cleared the latrines? Somebody had to do it. All these terraced houses or big posh houses, they had their latrines, their netties, in the backyards down alleyways, and people would be paid to clear them. And this I touch on in the book, 10 pounds. <laughs> in terrible Georgian jobs. You'd pay 12. You're in, first in the queue, mother. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible Georgian jobs. One of the terrible Georgian jobs was the night soil men. I know, they used to work in gangs of four. In the dead of night when you're all meant to be asleep with a horse and cart. Now I say it's a terrible job. By all accounts, it actually wasn't. It wasn't badly paid. And apparently it was very social. They used to be heard whistling and chatting. And what they would do, they'd pitch up at a netty in the dead of night, and you'd have a hole man whose job it was to dive into the hole of the netty with a spade, put it into a big bucket, and then you had the two bucket men who would haul the bucket up to the tub man who would then tip the contents into the back of a horse-drawn carriage and move on their way to the next and go through the same process again. And then they would take the stuff out to the countryside and sell it to, I'm assuming you're from farming stock over here. Yes, and sell it to your ancestors, <laughs> the farmers. And the carrots you were talking about in the Georgian period had a particular taste, I can tell you. <laughs> 
Again, totally environmental friendly. And in the middle of London, there's still a wharf called Dung Wharf, where they used to drop all the dung. And market gardeners, again, nothing changes. Market gardeners would go at three o'clock in the morning and buy the fresh produce to take home to their little yards or window boxes and grow flowers and vegetables. It's remarkable, isn't it? Very good question there, madam. Give her a round of applause. Nice question. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Oh, I was asking if there's any doctors in the house. I mean, if there is, obviously you're not going to admit it now. <laughs> Anybody with any medical training whatsoever? We, we have one there. Did you put your hand up? Yeah. You are, are you a doctor? Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, do you just like practicing medicine no, on people? No. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? A nurse drove his wife. Oh, well, you are you medically trained. So let's talk about some medical cures. So today, for say, blackheads, I mean, we've all had, particularly as teenagers, you get blackheads, don't you? And you pick them out, and then it causes all sorts of problems. What would we use today to cure blackheads? Fluorocyl. A, a, cre a cream, would we use anything? Yeah, an ointment. The Georgians had their own ointments. <laughs> The blackheads. One, first of all, they believed genuinely that blackheads were alive. Wow. They believed that blackheads were worms. And that you couldn't squeeze a blackhead worm out of your face until it was dead. Because if you attempted to squeeze it out of your face whilst it was alive, it might go back in again and cause all sorts of difficulties. So they had to kill the blackheads and they used to kill them with ointments and they used to make their own ointment and this ointment used to double up as a sore eye ointment so we were doing too much i know it's a thing. how they ever survived the torches were very good at killing themselves the average lifespan was 40 years old you know that 40 years old the vast majority of them drowned uh, what are you looking at me like that for i mean i'm not yeah <laughs> Because most Georgians couldn't swim. Anyway, I'll come on to that. Blackheads, let's stick to the blackheads. We used to make their own ointments, and the same ointment would cure sore eyes. And when we were working for computers, watching too much TV, reading whatever, they were doing the same, but under candlelight, and it was hurting their eyes. And so they had to make these eye ointments, but the same ointment worked for the blackheads, and this is what they were doing. You had to have two pewter dishes, has to be pewter, and then you get a natural product, something we like to call urine. Yes? <laughs> so you can produce that yourself, again, saving money and the environment, right? So you would put the urine in the pewter pot, like shell, like you make a clam shell, put it onto a heat source, put the other clam shell pewter lid over the top of it, and periodically, as the urine would heat, it would steam up and condensate on the top pewter pot lid and you would open up the clam and drip out the condensated urine into a little pot and you would continue doing this over a period of time until all the urine had evaporated. Then you would get that pot and then you would dab it onto your finger, onto your blackhead, which would kill the blackhead. You'd leave it on for 10 minutes and then you could pick it out. And if you had those dreadful sore eyes, you'd get the same liquid <laughs> and drop it in, and it would solve all our eye problems. <laughs> Remarkable, aren't they? <laughs> did they wear perfume? That's a very good question. Yes, they did wear perfume. Obviously, they would make their own perfume, and they would buy perfume like, like we do today. But there's a very good reason for the Georgians wearing perfume. Do you know what that is? Well, they stand to high ever. Because they didn't bathe like we bathe. It was very normal for an ordinary Georgian person to go months without bathing, particularly in the winter. Farmers were the worst. <laughs> As we can see. And do you know what the Georgians used to love night? Joe, have you ever worn a night shirt? Mm -hmm. yeah. A night shirt. I, I think I had one many years ago. I remember my dad used to have a night shirt. Very long and a, and a sleeping shirt. Oh, 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 yeah. So, so you ever wear? Oh, yeah. Is this it? Is this the night shirt? Yeah. Oh, 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 
It's great. They're very, very sensible. That sensible way. Right down to your ankles, long sleeves, right up here, and, and, and a sleeping cap. But the Georgians during the winter months would very often never get out of their sleeping gown, their night shirt. They would literally go to bed, wake up freezing cold in the winter, put their work clothes on, go off, get all nice and sweaty. You might be a night soil man, I don't know, whatever you do. You go home, have your tea, take your clothes off, leave your night shirt on, go to bed, and do this for three months. So yes, madam, perfume was very much needed. And also all sorts of smelly things were needed because talking about medical <coughs> issues and problems, bad tea was, was a big problem because of the, the diet, the sugar and the, the acid and all of that. And they used to cure toothache, they had major problems with tooth, toothache, but no anaesthetic, no proper dentist. Often the horse doctor would pull out teeth. It was very normal to go to the local vet to have your teeth pulled out. But when you had toothache, we're going back to the only medically trained person in the room. What do you think they used, madam, to cure their toothache? <laughs> think of animal products, the worst bits of animals. Obviously, we're talking about Georgians here. I'll give you a clue. It's fish, and it's the fish eyes. They would mash up the fish eyes, they'd use everything, the Georgians, mash them up and then put the paste on the sore tooth. And by all accounts, it works. I mean, breath problems, I mean, that is a, there's a downside to everything. But apparently that works. And as for teeth, you know, we talk about having our teeth whitened or having re replaced teeth and go and get new teeth today, made, whatever. The Georgians used to have false teeth. They would have teeth made, wood, bone, ivory, or real human teeth. They would use them. And if you had enough money and you could find a willing partner in this business transaction, you could both go to the dentist or horse doctor, both get strapped into a chair, say, you need a new tooth. This fella's got a really good tooth, but he needs some money. The horse doctor goes to your back tooth, he dives in with a pair of pliers, often called pelicans, because the beaks were long and thin like a pelican, he'd rip out the back tooth, you would probably either be dead or fainted. <laughs> if you weren't dead, you were still a willing player in this, he would go over to this fellow who needs the money, have a look at the tooth that's just come out of your head, have a look in your mouth, find the best matching tooth, and pull out the healthy tooth, ram it into your mouth, wire it in, pack it in, and hope to God that the tooth stuck. And it did. Not always, but it did. And you would go home not happy, but you'd have a bit of cash, because there was no social help in those days. And another way, if you couldn't find someone, you couldn't afford to pay somebody to donate their living tooth, you could buy a human tooth from dodgy doctors, who would take the teeth from dead people. The problem with that, if the dead person died of some horrible disease, it would very likely be transmitted to you. You can see why they only live till 40, can't you, right? It's amazing that any of us are actually here. But in 1815, those, oh sorry, I've, I've bored you, tell you what. It's gonna go against the street, is it? Yeah. There was, in 1815, a very famous battle. Does anybody know what that famous battle was? Waterloo was when Napoleon was finally defeated by Wellington. After 1815, there came onto the market a huge supply of teeth. They were referred to as Waterloo teeth. And they were teeth taken from the battlefield from very healthy, fit young men, that is, until they were killed from the battlefield. They were taken and brought back to Britain and sold and for transfer, transplanting Waterloo teeth. But they say that very many more Waterloo teeth were sold to patients than were ever taken from the battlefield. So dodgy doctors 
were ripping teeth out of all sorts of corpses and flogging them off as young, healthy, watering teeth. Don't you just feel so proud about your Georgia <laughs> Aren't they amazing? Right, but it's now bright time, time for the bar to reopen. But when you come back, and you will be back because all doors are chained. He's the only one that's been allowed to escape. <laughs> when you come back, I'm going to ask you a couple of quiz questions. History related. I might have given you some top tips and the things that we talk about. And I'm going to give away a couple of very special prizes, but I'm not going to tell you what they are now. So you can go to the bar, tea. <laughs> How you know? I never thought about that. Yeah. I've got five very special Waterloo tea. So go to the bar, come back in 20 minutes, or you can buy my book during the break. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. the second part of this with a couple of questions and I have promised you a couple of prizes. The prizes are two of my books. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I didn't tell you beforehand, did I? <laughs> so I just hope that whoever's bought the book wins another one. <laughs> because you're going to get it whether you want it or not. <laughs> There you go, you see that's marketing. You see? <laughs> All right. So here we go, here's a Georgian related question. Now I love sayings, and so many sayings we use in everyday life. I'll cover off a couple of them. You can trace back to the Georgian period. I'm going to start with a very easy one, but here's the question. Where does the saying, to turn a blind eye, come from? Oh my, you said this was a group of intellectuals <laughs> the back there. Who? Customs. Customs? No. Nelson. Lord Nelson, give me a round of applause. Lord Nelson. <laughs> Come on down, sir, tell us the whole story. <laughs> Lord. No, because he had a patch on his arm. See, Lord, they're great. He's one of my heroes, Lord Nelson. And in actual fact, Lord Nelson. He came from very ordinary stock, by the way. He went to sea at the age of 12, barely had any schooling at all, but he was a damn good seaman and a damn good fighter. And that's what he loved doing more than anything else, fighting, which is why he died at Trafalgar at the age of 47, wearing all his regalia because he loved to show off, but he loved fighting, which is why he was blown up several times, stabbed, shot twice, and lost an eye. Didn't bother him because he loved what he was doing. And this, we can trace back this saying to 1801 at the Battle of Copenhagen, when Lord Nelson was doing what he loves and doing what he does best, fighting. Today he was fighting the Danes. And he was in the harbour getting bombarded from all angles, just about obliterated, but having just a great day out. <laughs> when his commanding officer sat nice and safely about a mile out to sea, could see what was going on, Nelson was going to get blown to smithereens. So he sent a flag signal, hoisted up, into the harbour, instructing Nelson to exit the fight because he's going to be obliterated. So during the fight, Nelson's lieutenant comes up to him and says, Sir, we've been ordered 
flag signals to get out of the harbour. Nelson was furious. He said, show me that flag signal. He got the lieutenant's telescope, put it up to his blind eye, <laughs> tuned in, and he said, I see no such signal. Continue fighting. And he did, and he won the day. Nelson turned a blind eye. And the Admiralty were always turning a blind eye to Nelson because he was always up to these tricks. But he was so good at what he did, they turned a blind eye. Sir, did you buy a book? Uh, no. No? Oh, for goodness <laughs> sake. Well, Come and one collect one. it at the end then. With no, no at the end, this is my show. It's not the end, by the way. <laughs> it's not even the beginning of the end. Yeah. Yeah. What was your name? Max. Max. Great. Thank you, Max. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, Max comes to every of my shows. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Max. Great to see you. I'll see you at yours for lunch tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, second question then. Back on to, let's stick with Lord Nelson. So, Nelson died in 1805 at the Battle of Trafalgar. Here's a couple of interesting points about Trafalgar. Something that we don't celebrate nearly enough in actual Battle of October. October the 20th, I think. 21st. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> you needn't have said that, actually. No, no books for you. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. Is anybody else a clever ass when it comes to 1805, you guys. A couple of interesting things about Trafalgar. Do you know that it took 16 days for the news, yeah. the success at Trafalgar, to reach reached the Admiralty in London by fast boat and fast courier. 16 days for the news to reach him. And had Nelson not won and died that day, then the combined French and Spanish fleet were going to dash over to the Caribbean, ransack the British territories over there, obliterate them, and then pour back across the Atlantic pick up the 300,000 French and Spanish troops waiting in northern France and invade England. And England would have been lost had it not been for Nelson. And tonight's show would be in French. <laughs> <laughs> and one of my favourite quotes in actual fact from one of Nelson's commanders at the time, after Trafalgar, this is so British, so wonderful, just think about this for a moment. He said that we've, we've won, Trafalgar, we've won. And he then said, I can't say that the enemy will not come, but I can say they will not come by sea. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. <laughs> How else were they going to come? <laughs> Such a beautiful British name. <laughs> so there you go. Who won? Did, have, have I, what's the question? Oh no, the question, right. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a minute. Like 1805, Battle of Trafalgar. So we've got four King Georges. Here is the question. Which one? Yeah, that's my question. <laughs> Which King George was on the throne in 1805? George III. Oh, he's back at it again. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up. Did, did you buy the book? Yes! Celebration! Celebration! <laughs> There you go, you can give away to all your friends and family, people you don't like and everything. What's your name again? David. David. Well, oh, no, I'm sorry, I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Yeah, yeah. I'll see that on eBay tomorrow. So thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Right, I'll tell you what I'm going to go back to. Wigs. We just we touched on wigs, didn't we? So, you know, the hair would thin, would drop out wigs. Now, I am going to show you what you would look like during the Georgian period. If you were fashionable and stylish like what I am. <laughs> this is what you would look like. Fully fledged wig, a gentleman's wig, 
Now, if I was walking down the street, madam, what would you think of me? <laughs> what description would come to mind as I'm strolling through the marketplace? George Michael. George Michael. George Michael. What, what? George Michael. <laughs> George Michael. <laughs> Somebody said plonker, which is quite possibly correct. But I think you would probably think of me as a big wig. Would you not? A big wig. Another Georgian saying. You know what big wig means? What does it mean? What does big wig mean, sir? Important. Successful. The local mayor, the police chief, the lawyer, the doctor, the big wigs. Do you know how they came to be called big wigs? Well, it's an obvious question. They were wearing big wigs. And what do you think wearing a big wig meant? Money, success, power. Because wigs were exceptionally expensive to create. I mean, this one, you might be surprised to hear, was not expensive to buy. But it's very hot. <laughs> They were so expensive, it was unbelievable. And they were using human hair, yak hair, goat hair, horse hair. And the bigger the wig, the more successful he was. So your black Range Rover is actually kicked into touch because he wouldn't have like, such an enormous wig. Now, there were problems with wigs, which I'll get to. But ladies used to wear wigs as well, of course. Now, here's something interesting. The average height of a Georgian lady was five feet tall. Yeah, quite small. The average height of a Georgian man, five foot five. Oh. Ladies' wigs, even though men would be called big wigs and big wigs, ladies' wigs were often even bigger. And it was not unusual, circa 1790, in Helmsley, to see a five foot tall lady walking through the marketplace wearing a wig three feet tall on her head. She's now eight feet tall with a five foot five gentleman <laughs> and all the gossip papers and everyone drawing caricatures of this disparity in height now it came with loads of problems there were no cars then but madam i assume you've got a car have you got a car yeah imagine if you had a wig three foot tall what kind of car have you got a small one. A small one? Okay. A small bed, please, is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's rich around here, isn't it? Yeah. Mind yeah. you, wouldn't think of about ticket lifestyles anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say it's a fiesta, right? Don't look so horrified. Imagine getting in your Ford Fiesta with a three foot tall wig. You'd have to go in like a torpedo, wouldn't you? You wouldn't be able to drive, you'd have to go in the back seat, you'd have to lie flat. This is what ladies had to do in 18th century Georgian carriages. They didn't have the headroom, they'd have to lay out either on the seat, or if there were other passengers, lay on the floor <coughs> so it didn't disrupt the wig. However, what do you think was in the on the floor, on the footwell, in the carriage? Horse manure all over the place. And also, imagine those carriages bouncing all over the place. You can't see the horizon, so the lady would get out feeling car sick, carriage sick, and full of horse manure, but looking fabulous, with a three foot tall wig. And they used to decorate them like Christmas trees, even with stuffed mice and birds used to put in their wigs. Ladies of high fashion. Sometimes they would wear them for months on end, because it would take so much effort to create this wig, they were often wired onto their heads. So if they were doing a season in London, they would keep this wig on, which meant they couldn't sleep in an ordinary bed because it would disrupt the wig and the beds were not long enough. So they'd have to sleep for months on end, sitting up. <laughs> so the prices they paid for fashion. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Fantastic. Here comes the big problem with wigs. Full of what? Rice. Wigs full of rice. Yes, this is one of the problems. Now then, because wigs, they didn't have hairspray in those days, they used to use a gel. So do you have any ideas what kind of gel they would use to fix the hair in place? Oh. Animal fat! The Georgians <laughs> loved their animals, didn't they? They loved animals, the Georgians. So much so, they used every single bit of them. 
animal fat, they would push, pour into their hair to style the wigs. Now this, over a period of time, created a very unfortunate aroma, <laughs> attracted rodents, lice, mice, or genuinely all sorts of horrible things. And the Georgians used to powder, you call the powder wig, used to powder the wig to actually degrease the greasiness. And then again, if you Google it, Georgian family portraits with wigs, you'll often see the portrait sitters with what looks like dandruff all over their shoulders. It's actually wig powder. And some of the Georgian men, the more funky guys, would use blue powder, pink, red, green, you know, like the punk rockers of the day, the dandies, would colour their wigs. So this is all sort of difficult management. This, you've got lice and ticks and all sorts in there. Here comes the big problem. When you wear a wig, that is laden with animal fat, and you go out to a big party, there is no electricity, there is candles. <laughs> so a gentleman could be walking across a room after having a couple of sharp gins, looking at the business until his head went past the candle and burst into flames. And his head would literally light up. And there are countless accounts of men had with their heads exploding at parties. But it was worth it because you looked great. <laughs> and talking of parties in 1760, have you ever wondered, has, has anyone ever roller skated? You've yes. all roller skated. When you were roller skating, when you were seven years old, did you ever wonder yourself as you were tearing down the street, I wonder who invented roller skating? Well, I mean, well, I used to. I mean, I'm the, am I the only one? <laughs> 1760 British invention. You couldn't make this up. He was called Joseph Merlin. Merlin. He invented them at a party to make an entrance at a party. He put some wheels on his shoes. He had lots to drink. He arrived at the party, tore down the hall, straight into a plate glass mirror. Joseph Merlin. <laughs> invented the roller skates in 1760. It's remarkable. Do we have any questions? So the wig party, is it any relation to physical wigs? The wig part, no, yeah. not at all. The, the, so the wig party is effectively the Labour party, yeah. and the Tory party is... Yeah. Uh, no, no, I think it's spelled differently in actual fact. Does anybody know whether the term wig... What's that? It's W-H-I-G, isn't it? Which, does anybody know? Because I might, I might make a note that could be in my second edition. <laughs> Good question, though. I'll research that. Any other questions? What about music? Music. Who's shouting that? Music. Yes. The Georgians love their music, just like we love our music. And they effectively had pop stars at the time as well. There were tavern folk singers who would tour the taverns singing their songs. And I can tell you, that if you read some of the lyrics from the Georgian equivalent of pop songs, the tavern songs, they're absolutely outrageous. Our daughter is a musician in London, and uh, every other word is a swear word. I mean, it's just unbelievable. She's like a, 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 like a rapper. I mean, how on earth is that? I don't even think she's my daughter. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I know you looked over there, my wife sat in the corner, didn't you? Thought, yeah, I don't, yeah, I wonder, yeah. <laughs> And so we're some to them, we, we only kids, but music is leery and sweary these days. It was worse then. But it was storytelling. I loved folk music, Georgian folk music, always storytelling. And they did not rip into the powerful, the kings and the leaders and the politicians. They genuinely had proper freedom of speech. You could say and write anything about anybody. You could do it. And these guys used to tour the taverns and make lots of money. And they also used to sell their music sheets. So like a pop star today will write a song that goes for number one, makes itself a few million quid. These guys would write a track, music, and the words, and then they would sell the sheets. So they would be posted out to the taverns where the revelers in the feathers or something in, in Helmsley would be waiting for the new tune and the new words, they'd all learn the words, the locals, some of the new 
guys that could play a musical instruments would learn the music and they'd all sing and dance to the new latest song. So again, not going to change it. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, there were pop stars of the 18th and early 19th century. Very good question. Any others? Food and drink. F f what's that? Food and drink. Drink is a big one. The Georgians loved to drink. And they loved two drinks in particular. Very different kinds of drinks. The first one, gin. Gin. They did not love gin. We love gin today. You go to a pub, it used to be you'd have a gin and tonic, they might ask you what kind of tonic you want. Now they ask you what kind of gin you want, you've got a list of like a hundred options. Gin is very trendy, it's fashionable. I was filming with a gin distillery in London not very long ago. It's all very cool and sophisticated. Not during the Georgian period. Gin was at least double the strength. It could literally blow your head off. People were dying on the street after drinking it by the pint. <laughs> I know, it's true. They would do that for a number of reasons. One, it was cheaper than buying clean water, which was almost impossible. Two, it would stave off hunger and it would keep you warm in the winter. So this was for the very poor people, but even the rich people were drinking gin as well because they loved just getting drunk. They used to add even onto the teeth sulfuric acid, they used to add sulfuric acid into the gin just to give it an extra kick. <laughs> <laughs> and it did not. It did not give it a kick. There are even instances of spontaneous human combustion. Literally, there were two ladies in South Hall in London, only their feet were found. The rest of them, they burst into flames after a big drinking session. Gin. Do you know why gin became so popular? It was called the gin craze. I'll give you a clue. It's something to do with taxation and the French. But what happened was this. Prior to the gin craze, British people were drinking, go on, brandy. Brandy, I knew you would know. <laughs> Honestly, it's like, oh, what, brandy? Like, of course everybody knows. <laughs> brandy, they were drinking copious amounts of brandy. Now, the British government decided, I think probably rightly so, look, we're fighting the French. Why should we buy their brandy? Why should we fund their war effort against us? Let's smash the French brandy trade. So what they did is they reduced all taxes on homemade gin distilling down to zero. They reduced the cost of the ingredients needed to make gin to almost nothing. So every Tom, Dick and Harry, like today, set up gin distilleries and everybody was drinking gin because it was so cheap. You'd walk around towns and there'd be gin sellers wandering around selling you shots of gin. And as I mentioned, it was cheaper to drink gin to keep warm, you didn't feel the cold, and to stave off hunger. And this is where we get the term gin palaces from. You know, this one refers to something as a gin palace. In London, there were literally thousands of gin palaces where you could buy cheap gin. It, it could be a house, it could be a shed, it could be a bar, whatever. So the government, their trick to smash the French brandy trade worked. It imploded on itself. However, society basically went into complete and utter meltdown and mayhem. So the, it took the government 80 years to bring the gin craze <coughs> to an end. First of all, what did they do? Everything's going to hell, the world is crazy, and no one's working, everybody's drunk. They, let's, I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll just ban gin. They just thought, we'll ban gin, and that will solve the problem. All it did was cause riots in the streets and murders. There were gangs of gin gangs of people wandering around the streets of our cities looking for informers, gin informers, who were telling the authorities who was brewing gin. It was madness. It took them 80 years to bring it under control. But luckily, we had another laugh. Another... You're not included in this one, by the way. <laughs> you, William, and his wife, madam, 
I don't know how you can live with him. I really don't. It must be a complete nightmare. <laughs> Good. What other drink did the British fall in love with? Tea. tea. Do we all love tea? Yeah. Well, do you know what? One thing about the British is this. We don't now appreciate our tea like we should do. Because how much does it cost to make a cup of tea today? A couple of pence, yeah. literally a couple of pence. If we went back to the early Georgian period, 1714, if say you four had a pot of tea for four, that would cost you probably anywhere between 50 and 100 pounds to make that tea. It was so expensive because of the import costs. The East India Company had the right to bring the tea in. It was colossally expensive, which of course created opportunities for smuggling, money laundering, and fakery. There was one fake tea called British tea, which sounds rather nice. If I went to Sainsbury's, I'd probably buy something that said British tea. I probably would, but British tea was a fake tea. It was sold as real tea from China, but it was made using indigenous leaves and basically killed everybody that drank. <laughs> but it was cheap. It was cheap. And if you wanted a cheap cup of tea, you'd drink British tea, right? And that's what you do. Never mind that Yorkshire tea, drink British tea. <laughs> so tea was costly expensive. But over the years, of course, with all sorts of you know changes in trade and everything else, tea became much cheaper and by, I don't know, say 1880, everybody could afford tea, which is why, if you're interested in antiques, like that's my background, when you look at these little tea caddies from the early 18th century, they're tiny, because tea was so colossally expensive, and they all had a lock in them, because the lady of the house would keep the key off and around her neck for the tea caddy, because the servants had a dreadful reputation for nicking the tea and then flogging it because a servant girl could make as much money selling one teaspoon of tea as she earned as an average weekly wage. That's how expensive tea was. So anyway, things moved on. And so if you have a tea caddy at home, you can basically, as a rule of thumb, date it. If it's a tiny tea caddy, it's early. If it's a great big whopper, it's much later. There you have tea it. So when you drink your tea tomorrow morning, madam, I hope you're going to appreciate it. Yes. And if you have your friends around, charge them 50 quid for a pot of tea for four. <laughs> Any other questions? Did they have coffee and chocolate then? Did they have coffee and chocolate? They did at the same time. They used to drink chocolate drinks and coffee drinks. They would have the coffee houses where they would drink coffee and tea, which of course is where Lloyd's of London was founded. So they would do business. They'd, they'd use them again, like today, little business hubs, get-togethers. Today you might have an internet cafe or uh, you know just a social get-together. They would they would use the coffee and the tea houses for that. Again, coffee was very expensive, but it was the tea that the British really took a liking to. Did they always put milk in it then, or did that come much later? That's a good question. Did they put milk in their tea? Well, you, you know, again, if, if you go to somebody's home, do we still do this? I know we used to years ago, like the days of my grandparents, they would do this. You go to someone's home, they would offer you a cup of tea, and all eyes would be on the teapot, boiling tea, and the china cup. And you'd be lucky to see whether the pourer put milk in the cup first or poured the tea. Do you remember that? Yeah. Do you know why they did that? It was a sign of, you know, whether you had money, you didn't freedom, you didn't posh or not. So if you were posh, you would pour your boiling hot tea into your teacup without the milk. And the reason for that was this, you were proving to whoever was about to receive the cup of tea that your porcelain was of a certain standard to withstand the boiling hot tea. If it was of a poor standard, you would very sheepishly pour in a little milk to cool the tea so your teacup didn't explode when the hot water hit it. And the reason for that is this. So up until 1750, the Euro British and the Europeans, we could not make 
forced us to, a, to a, as high a standard as the Chinese, where it's importing this Chinese very fine porcelain, which looked really delicate and ephemera, but was as hard as nails compared to our equivalents, the Delk, if you're interested in, in antiques. And that stuff could take the boiling hot tea. So prior to about 1750, if you had the money, you would buy the genuine Chinese porcelain, which would take the boiling tea. If you didn't, you'd buy a British or a European fake of a Chinese piece that would crack the moment you poured your hot tea into the cup. And I think it is something for older generations today as well. It's a mark of where somebody is in society. And just to tell everybody where you are to put milk in first or not. Milk in first. Oh, they're a bit rough down the front end here. Now this one here, they pour their tea in. No, no milk. Straight there you go, you see. <laughs> Right, shall we talk about George? Back to George and say, here's one for you. This is a great one. Laugh your head off. We all use it, don't we? Yeah. Oh, we went to, we saw, I was talking to someone earlier on, they were looking at the being to see a comedian, they laughed their heads off. Brilliant. Do you know where it comes from? I mean, obviously, this is George and show, so it comes from the Georgian. Not that I'm Oh my god, are you related to this girl? <laughs> <laughs> she read my book in the toilet. <laughs> Mind, you must be a speed reader, madam. There's 300 pages in there. A Scotsman had his head chopped off. Is that as much as you got from that whole story? It's about 10 pages. You should be doing this show yourself. You're right. He was a Scotsman. Can you remember the date? I mean, you read it. You only read it five minutes ago. 17 something. Yeah, that's the Georgian thing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to date it for you by now? Yeah. No, you can't just keep guessing dates. You, you just can't, can't do it. that. 3 p.m. 9th of April, 1747. When some Scotsman, you are right, had his head chopped off. But this was a very special Scotsman. He was a celebrity. Nothing new with celebrities. But he was one of these celebrities that everybody loved to hate. You know the ones? They loved to hate him. But he was a hateful kind of character. He was Simon Fraser, Lord Lovett. I mean, you couldn't make this up. You've got Merlin inventing the, the thing images. And Lord Lovett, chief of the clan Fraser. But in 1745, during the Jacobite Rebellion, he sided with King George II. Yet he forced one of his sons, just for fun, because this was the kind of guy he was, to fight the Jacobites. He was a nasty piece of work. Everybody hated Simon Fraser. His wife, his children, his servants, his tenants, everybody hated him. King George II discovered his duplicity, dragged him off to London and put him on trial for treason. London lit up. They loved him. He was found guilty and sentenced to have his head chopped off on the 9th of April, 1747. So popular was this event. Bearing in mind, no, no bargain hunch, no antiques road trip to watch, they had nothing to do. All they could do was drink gin and go to public executions. That was their entertainment. But this was a very big <coughs> execution. Tens of thousands of people lined the streets in London to watch Simon Fraser, this guy they've been reading about for years, go by. They couldn't believe their eyes, they could see him. Now, if you were wealthy enough, there was a platform built with a chopping block to get his head on. If you had the money, you could buy tickets like this. They built a platform, a raised platform, around the chopping area, basically the theatre stand here. So you could watch from above the whole event. If you didn't have the money, you'd have to just be half a mile away hoping to catch a glimpse of something. So all these rich people paid a fortune to climb up this scaffolding and sit on seats to watch the proceedings. Simon Fraser was brought out. As his head was put on the block, 
the whole crowd in the scaffolding seating, just like you would do now, you, they stood up and leant forward. And as soon as they did that, the scaffolding swayed, it moved, it wobbled, and it imploded on itself. 300 people fell to the ground. A couple of dozen were killed instantly. Bodies all over the place. Complete mayhem broke out. Simon Fraser still has his head on the block. He looks up. He sees what's going on. What did he start to do? Laugh. He was laughing uncontrollably. This was the best day out Simon Fraser had ever had. <laughs> he loved it. He was a sadist. He adored all this death and mayhem. The authorities got the situation under control, took them half an hour, finally got Simon Fraser's head on the block. He was still laughing uncontrollably, crying his eyes out as the axe came down. Simon Fraser, Lord Lovett, chief of the clan Fraser, literally laughed his head off. Isn't that wonderful? Should we give him a round of applause? <laughs> Sayings, Georgian sayings. Oh, here's, here's one for you. Tattoo. Do we have anybody in the audience who has a tattoo? You see, if you were all in your 20s, every hand would go up. As I said to my daughter, if you want to be unusual, don't have a tattoo. <laughs> that didn't go down very well, I can tell you. So nobody has a tattoo. My, oh, look at you two sheepish ones at the back. They certainly seem that they're expensive. We'll see how the solicitors can afford them. <laughs> how, how, how many tattoos have you got? I mean, I'm not going to ask you to show them. <laughs> <laughs> Just the one. Just one. Have you both got tattoos? Yeah. Are they matching tattoos? No, no, okay, you're not that Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know where the word tattoo comes from? <laughs> it's Georgian. <laughs> you can thank a local man for it, Captain James Cook. <laughs> you know Captain James Cook, he had discovered Australia. I mean, obviously, people have been living there for several millions of years, but he sort of discovered it, right? <laughs> Captain James Cook. Now, I mentioned earlier on that the Georgians couldn't swim. Ja Captain James Cook couldn't swim. In fact, because he couldn't swim, he was killed by natives in Hawaii. They were coming for him. He was on the beach. His men were rowing from his ship to save him. Honestly, all he had to do was jump in the sea and swim to the boat. If he was able to swim, he wasn't able to swim, so he was stabbed to death. Anyway, so there you go. If anyone can't swim, it's a seriously good idea to learn how to swim. <laughs> Tattoos. We know that sailors have always loved tattoos, and they've loved them for centuries. And the Georgian sailors used to, where's your tattoo? Just say roughly, or whoever. Between the shoulder blades. Between the shoulder blades, okay. The Georgian sailors used to have them all over the place, including on their feet, on each foot. Because they couldn't swim, I know. Pay, you know, because it is painful to have it done. Not that I have it, well. Well, not there who I can discuss anyway. anyway. <laughs> they used to have on their feet, they used to have one foot tattooed with a rooster and one foot with a pig. Because it's known that pigs and roosters cannot swim. So they thought if they had a pig and a rooster on each foot, if they fell overboard, the pig and the rooster would struggle like hell to get out of the water and help them onto dry land. So that's one place to get them. But the word tattoo was brought back by these sailors from Polynesia, that part of the world, with Captain James Cook. And the original Polynesian word for tattoo is tatau. So these guys came back with Polynesian tatau's, and the word tatau was soon corrupted to tattoo. Thank your Georgian ancestors. <laughs> for that. And actually, actually, Captain James Cook did say that it was a terribly painful experience, the act of tattooing. But prior to being referred to as being tattooed, you were either painted, embroidered, or pricked if you had a tattoo. Good one. Any other questions? A couple more. See if they're coming in fast and furious. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 As the blood. 
End of life, what? Are you feeling like you're coming to the end of your life? Is it that bad? <laughs> End of life. What, yeah. what about end of life? Well, what do the traditions? That's interesting. To think about Sorry. Questions. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming. I mean, seriously. <laughs> I'm feeling... They weren't as religious as, as you might think they oh, were, yeah. the Georgians, but they were very worried about end of life. I'll give, give them that. I've just written a book called A Bash with the British Empire, and the people of the empire in the later 19th century kind of loved death. They spent loads of money on funerals, like we do on weddings, very little on weddings, big money on funerals. The Georgians were more afraid of it. And one reason for that, of course, they were afraid of the body snatchers. Because there was money in snatching bodies. This is one of the reasons why we, we you know, made such inroads in medicine discoveries, because doctors wanted bodies. And so people towards their end of their life were desperately worried that they were going to be ending up on a doctor's slab and experimented on. So you'll often see, particularly in Scotland, they're still there, mort safes. So a grave, if you Google it, you'll see them, 18th century graves with a mort safe over the top of it, which was basically a cast iron cage attached over the top of the grave so the body snatchers couldn't get at them. So yes, they were fearful of it. And also, here's a one for you, <clears throat> something to think about tonight, because it's coming towards bedtime. There was another horrible job during the Georgian period called a sin eater. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. You're going to really regret asking this question. Right? <laughs> a sin eater was someone who was employed to eat your sins away after your death. So at your funeral, a sin eater would come in and they would serve him a meal from your chest or your stomach. And I'm, you asked the question. It's an audience. It's, I don't know what questions are coming. And the sin eater would eat a meal off the dead body. And it was believed that in that meal, in that food, he would take on the sins of your life. So you could pass on to a better place without sin. And the sin eater would then go off to another village and look for a funeral. Now, sin eaters were not the kind of people you'd invite around for dinner. <laughs> because they were so full of everyone else's sin, they all lived alone. So, you, see, you, think, we, we, you think we have a tough time with the kind of jobs we do? <laughs> Honestly, God, these people made you, by the way. <laughs> what time is it? It's about, what time, how have we got? Four days? Have we got four days? Because I have only covered a couple of pages. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, what, what about hygiene? You, you mentioned the light in the wings and, and mm. presumably on the body. Was, was there any concern about that? Did they deal with it at all? Or? You know what? They weren't that concerned with hygiene, the Georgians. It was just normal to them. And they were very open about these things. I'll give you here, here, here's an example. The Georgian sideboard. You, this will make sense in a moment, madam, I promise you. The Georgian sideboard. The si who's got a sideboard at home in their dining room? One? I mean, do you have a dining room? I mean, what, <laughs> what kind of houses do you live in? <laughs> My granny did. Your granny had one. Right, sideboards. Have you ever wondered when the sideboard was invented? No. Of course you haven't because you're normal. I have, right? <laughs> the Georgians invented the sideboard. And my favourite sideboard, which came out in about 1770, is one with a little cupboard around the side. So just picture a sideboard in your mind's eye. Drawers for cutlery, napkins, that kind of thing. Cupboards for plates, bowls, pots. Maybe a bottle drawer, leg lined for your wines. There was a sideboard in the later Georgian, in the middle Georgian period, with a pot covered around the side to hold pots. Do you know what kind of pot it held? A potty. The kind of potty granny would keep under a bed in case she got caught short. Exactly the same. They're talking about hygiene and body things and everything else. They were very easy going, very liberal, very 1960s hippie-like, the Georgians. <laughs> And bear in mind they had no toilet facilities. If you had a big party, a big Christmas celebration, birthday, whatever, and you were serving from your very fine, refined Georgian dining table, the Georgians were actually very refined. They wanted to be refined. They wanted to improve themselves, and they wanted to improve 
the world, which they did. They were fantastic inventors, and this is a great invention. So what they do, no toilets. They, the guest, the host in the, of the evening would put a privacy screen in the corner of the room, and the potty in the pot cupboard would be brought out and put behind the privacy screen. So any ladies or gentlemen, and I emphasize the word ladies because they were exactly the same, if they got caught short, they would go behind the little privacy screen, excuse me everybody, I won't be long, they would use the facilities and then come back out and join the party at the dinner table. A servant would periodically through the night pick up the bowl, walk through the dining room, outside, <laughs> tip it out, and back in again. Now there are loads of accounts from this period of ladies who were sat at the Georgian dining table who literally couldn't stand up because they were so drunk but desperate for a win. So the poor servant would be instructed to crawl under the table, under the crinoline skirt, deposit the potty, and then when finished, would then go and enter the potty. And if the potty, you'd be shaking your head, this is all true. You'd be doing this at Christmas time as a Christmas party, so you will. We do in my house, we do every year, yeah? But of course we've got seven. Anyway. <laughs> When the potty was in use, accounts galore of big gravy boats being introduced in the place of the potty. Yeah. Wow. You've heard that, yeah. Yeah. have you? It's, it's wonderful, honestly. The different, different shapes, are they difficult to use? I don't know. <laughs> uh, let's find something, um, what else have we got? Let's a little celebration. Here's a celebration for you. A relatively local guy, the inventor of matches in 1827. Let's end it on a big celebration of great philanthropic, is that the right word, Georgian characters. Do you know who invented the match? No. Don't you even dream. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Swan, no. Mr. Vesta, no. Mr. Vesta, no. It was Mr. Walker, wasn't it? You can you can agree with me now. It's worth another book. It is. Yeah. <laughs> you aren't getting any more books, Mr. <laughs> John Walker from Stockton on Tees. What a hero this guy was. 1827. He was a chemist. Had a chemist shop on Stockton High Street. Single guy. <laughs> Happy, obviously. <laughs> I know. Had his own business, plenty of cash, having a life on Riley, I can tell you, right? He invented by accident this material, this thing, this ingredient, this chemical reaction, whilst at home experimenting. He ignited it, he invented the match. So, what he did, he put this little chemical thing, hot thing, let it dry, put it on sticks, put the sticks in little boxes. And for 50 sticks, he would sell them on Stockton High Street for the equivalent of seven pounds. And he called them fire sticks. Simple as that. They sold like hotcakes. I mean, in those days, you would pay seven pounds for a box of 50 matches. Because if you didn't have any matches, how do you think you would light the fire? Flint. Flint? Take that. That's how you do it. You have to try and keep a fire going. These matches were an amazing invention. And all of John Walker's friends and family said to him, John, patent this idea. You will make a fortune. And John Walker said, I'm happy, bachelor. I've got plenty of money. I've got my business. I don't need any more money. But the world needs light and it needs heat. I'll let anybody in the world use my ingredients and make their own boxes of fire. Let's give John Walker a round of applause. <laughs> another example of a Georgian person who changed the world for the better. One more question if you have any. You all just want to go home, don't you? <laughs> okay. Sport. Sport. Yeah. They loved a bit of sport, the Georgians. The Georgians used to play football, do you know that? 
Yes, but the football rules, the proper football rules, as we understand them now, were introduced, I think, about 1876, when football fans here will probably know. I did film a piece about this for the BBC, but I showed zero interest in it. I think it was about 1870, 1880, something like that. The Georgians used to play football. Football's been played for donkey's years. There are accounts in my book of Georgian football matches that went on for days. <laughs> matches between villages, this was normal. There was no set size for a pitch. If your village was three miles away from my village, that was the pitch. We would choose girls in your village and girls in my village, and the competition would be for me to get to you and score through your, your, your girls. And even if it was three miles away, there was even one case in Whitehaven where the goalposts in Whitehaven were the har was the harbour. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and there was a, another, like five miles away, another <coughs> goalpost in a village. There's an account in the book of a football match in Derby that included 1,000 players, most of whom were drunk, and several died on the pitch. <laughs> so yes, they did enjoy their sport, I must say. Yeah, and it was much more exciting than the football you watch today. <laughs> well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think, I, honestly, it's been lovely being here. And thank you for the questions, because I love that. The idea of just kind of talking at you is, I, I don't like it. I like that kind of interaction. So thank you for that. Helps with you being marvellous. So before you go, is anybody on social media? God, God, what? <laughs> I mean, I know it's a younger thing, but come on, you must be on place. You are. So now you're... Well, look, you can see that there's a few seats empty here. I could really do with selling more theatre tickets. So if you've enjoyed tonight, please, I'm on Facebook, David Harper Antiques, Twitter, David Harper TV, which stands for television, not Trump. That's <laughs> but I know. <laughs> you know what? I, I, you're so right. Honestly, don't get me started. I would sell more tickets. That's for sure. And the BBC would throw work at me like there was no tomorrow. <laughs> Instagram as well. So if you've enjoyed it, please switch. And you can take pictures. Say nice things and I'll share them. Go, oh, darling, you wonderful. All of that. So, all of that. Yeah. Now, but equally, it's very important if you haven't enjoyed the show, equally, you know, negative, there's no such thing as negative feedback. Post it. But post that to at George <laughs> the Third. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.